even though I wasn't coordinated with the theme of the conference, um, just having uh, women like Nicola and uh, Megan and Beth in our TCC and our leadership midst, um, it just seemed right that the first Sakai girl, I'm sure it would be a Sakai girl rather than a Sakai boy. So probably next year I'll get Sakai boys, but this time I've always made Sakai girls in the blue version first and then the pink version. But this time the Sakai pink version is first and the blue version will be second. So, and again, it's, to me it was in a way to honor the, the women that have been part of our leadership all along for these past 10 years. And it's, uh, it's been great to have a diverse group of people in our leadership all along. So, but that's not my talk. Okay, I should probably start now so we have plenty of time for questions. And so the title of my talk is the uh, first 10 years and uh, maybe it was something about the next 10 years. It's mostly about the first 10 years. Um, so, um, and I kind of gave part of this talk uh, at the South Africa conference remotely because I couldn't make it. So it's going to be soon that we're going to be celebrating the various 10th anniversaries of all kinds of things that uh, we in this room have created over the past decade. We're kind of in the ninth year, but it's okay to sort of January 22nd was when we issued the press release heard around the world that was the announcement of the Sakai project and everybody sat up and took notice because the world was very different in 2004, right? We have Blackboard 7 and 8 laying around, we got WebCT Community Campus Edition, we have WebCT Vista that's just kind of coming out but not really working very well. And, and basically the, the vendors in the marketplace were selling really crappy software and not really doing anything to make, barely doing anything to make that software better. And so every, this was kind of a, dis everyone claims they're disruptive. And this was kind of a disruptive thing. Um, and so the thing that, that in retrospect made it so effective was uh, the founding partners of Michigan, Indiana, MIT, and Stanford. Everyone goes like, holy crap, if those four people actually will like get together and do something together, that might actually be something that we would care about. And literally I put probably 500,000 miles in airplanes in the next year just telling people, because they were like, what does this really mean? And so when we started, we said we were going to be different, right? We didn't name ourselves a learning management system on purpose. We called ourselves a collaboration and learning environment because we contextualize learning different. Well, what we didn't realize is, although this sort of post-dates us, Darcy Norman, he has this law of e-learning tool convergence. It says any e-learning tool, no matter how openly designed, will eventually become distinguishable from a learning management system once a threshold of supported use cases been reached. And that basically says that if you are going to be in the business of displacing Blackboard as your primary goal of your organization, you are going to have to end up mirroring many of the features that they have or you won't displace them. And recent entrants in the marketplace have suffered the same thing. They slowly but surely have to, in the limit, approach Blackboard. We thought that didn't apply to us. We were so cool and so cool and hipster and everyone loved us so much that this law didn't apply to us. But in retrospect, it did, given that we tried to build a product which is an enterprise learning management system where Blackboard was who you replaced. This is one of my favorite diagrams from uh, <coughs> um, Phil Hill, and he shows sort of over the time where, where we became into existence in 2004. Um, you probably can't read all this, but really, if you look in 2004, we have this world where Blackboard kind of owns really 85%-ish or 88% of the marketplace and everybody else is just the tiny dwarfs. Moodle's a tiny dwarf, Angel's a tiny dwarf, WebC, uh, Desired Learn's a tiny dwarf, WebCT looks like they have maybe 4 or 5% of the market share, Vista's just kind of barely getting started. And that's the world into which we were born. And in a sense, when we were born, our goal really was to deal with this group of folks who are homegrown, right? Uh, Yale is a good example of that, where Yale just had a bunch of Perl that had been hacked up for over years, and they're just like tired of maintaining their own Perl because they didn't want, they wanted somebody else to help make more features. And so it's a good example. Stanford had CourseWorks, uh, Michigan had Chef, 
you know, and, 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 and so, so the whole goal of this project ultimately was to take some of these people, not necessarily to displace these folks, but to take those people in this green van and get them to band together. And if you kind of look, you see sort of the green band is, you know, we've sort of got some of that green band. And of course, in the intervening time, you know, the nine years that this thing represents, we've got a lot of companies starting and a lot of things happening. So here we sit, starting with the somewhat humble beginnings, and we are sitting here with a 6% market share as reported by uh, Casey Green at, at EduCause last year. We had a higher market share than Instructure. I'm not sure that next year we'll have a higher market share than Instructure because they're moving pretty rapidly. Uh, this morning, if you saw, had a, the privilege to see uh, Dave Ackerman and Crystal Butler give their talk this morning. They uh, did a really wonderful, wonderful research that switched from the campus computing survey that CC Green did based on number of institutions, but then multiplied by the size of those institutions. And you see a slightly different view of the world. Blackboard's market share. Uh, Blackboard's market, let me just draw on this. Blackboard's market share is larger if you multiply by enrollment. Um, Moodle's market share is smaller if you multiply by enrollment. Uh, Sakai's, uh, this is Desire Learn. Desire Learn's market share is greater, so and then here is Sakai and Instructure. So, <clears throat> so again, you see we're a, we're a non-trivial part of the market, and I think that's really exciting and really something we can be proud of, in particular because whether it was because of our high principles or because we had no other choice, we have remained open source, community-centered, community leadership. We've not allowed a benevolent dictator to emerge that would start dictating to us as to how this product could be our current TCC committee chairmanship. We don't even allow that person to be in charge for more than six months. Uh, we sort of uh, we sort of are anti-central authority in this community, and, uh, and I think that's uh, really exciting. So if I go back and look at the last 10 years, um, this is the Gartner Hype Cycle, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna plot our releases on the Gartner Hype Cycle. So the Gartner Hype Cycle started in January 2004, where all of a sudden the entire world knew about us and thought that we were the solution to all humanity's problems in teaching and learning. It would shortly destroy Blackboard within a week or so. <laughs> and so we ended up with this amazing hype that just went up and up and up. Probably the most amazing evidence of the hype was we started in January. And by October of 2004, a mere 10 months later, the word Sakai like kind of had not been uttered outside of the television show Iron Chef. Mm -hmm. But by October, you could go in a, like a Brad Wheeler or Mara Hancock would give a keynote at EDUCAUSE, and they would say like, could everyone raise their hand who's heard the word Sakai? And like literally everybody at EDUCAUSE, every CIO, within eight months, this brand went from nothing to known by all, right? We were an amazing set of marketeers. I love flying, I love talking. Brad Wheeler loved flying and talking. We all just flew and talked and flew and talked and flew and talked, right? And so this, you could not hide under a rock in a faraway place without hearing about Sakai. I mean, it's almost more people more knew Sakai faster than they knew MOOCs almost back in those days. Unfortunately, the software that we had in our repository had little to do with the market sense that we were the great next big thing. And so we had quickly a very wide gulf between what the market thought of us and what we thought of our own software in our 1.0 release which is a terrible piece of software. One school in Leda ultimately put it into production. I found out six months later they'd done this, and I was like, are you fools? Mm -hmm. They said, well, it worked for us. We didn't, we had the right number of students. It worked, that I, I couldn't believe that anybody downloaded that and put it in production, but they had. Then the 1.5 release, which ended, was the end of 2004, was really not much better. I mean, it was a scary release. And that was when we decided to do a rewrite of kind of the entire tool model. It took four months. Five people, Mark Norton's in the room. Yeah, there's Mark Norton, um, Glenn, Mark, me, Lance, and Craig pretty much were kind of the people that sort of said, we gotta throw this mess that away. And that was, at that point, this was the moment in June of 2005 that we, we were going to live. Because if it weren't for that, we just would have died. Um, but the problem was, is even in 2.0, our height our hype couldn't be higher. That would be the Baltimore meeting where everyone wanted to come and we'd allowed non-members to come for the first time. And our hype was outrageous. 
Luckily, our software wasn't horrible. I mean, at least you could install it, and it didn't like format your hard drive and install viruses. <laughs> <laughs> and so we had a series of releases. In the old days, we would do a release every six months because our product was much simpler and our processes were simpler because we had this guy, Glenn, and he would only let you put something in if he liked it. And that time was both slow and fast at the same time. We could make releases happen because Trump stayed cleaner. And we had a series of rather incremental releases, 2021, 22, 23, 24, and 25. Some people will claim, Seth, or Seth, claim, Seth will claim that the quality, internal quality of our code base reached its absolute maximum sometime in this phase. And then what happened is, and you can even see it in the previous I slide. Never like that. What's that? <laughs> I never claimed that. You are on record as saying, I believe, that Skytune 4 is the best release ever. Oh, I thought you, were, I thought you agreed with me when I said that. <laughs> so, um, so, so what happened, interestingly, is things changed. Uh, the, the, the thing that changed between sort of the 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, and 2.6 time frame was that we went from a, a technical benevolent dictator to a more community-driven process. And that is now our strength, but at that point was our weakness, right? So we had this one guy who would check every commit and kick it out or rewrite it or do whatever, and we would slow to the speed of that one person. And we really had, by the time we got to 2.6, we would have had what you'd think of as four or five chief architects, which is not necessarily ideal, but it really sped us up. And our innovation was much more rapid, but our sort of the tightness of our code base and the, sort of the internal perfection and polish of it uh, really kind of went down. But we got more things out, and we got them out faster. And so at this point, um, you know, people had tried it. The uh, portfolio was disappointing to many people, and our, our sort of hype went down and down and down and down. <laughs> And uh, we contributed to this by uh, talking about the Sakai 3. Around this time frame, we started talking about Sakai 3. And so we also started talking about how bad the Sakai CLE was, because Sakai 3 was going to be so much better. So we kind of go into the uh, dark age phase, uh, that is the 2.6, 2.7. And so these are the releases that we want you to upgrade from, because they're the dark age releases. 2.8 is not exactly a dark age release. It was the beginning of the light. Uh, but it wasn't itself a great release. But these are the releases you do now want to be on. Okay? But there were the releases where our software was better than our PR, right? I mean, our, our public opinion was at its low, and our software was at least a little better than a very low public opinion. But the interesting thing that's happened in the last two years is our PR has gotten better, our governance has gotten better, uh, the OAE CLA relationship has gotten clarified over the past two years, and our software has gotten better. And so Sakai 2.9 kind of was the first moment where our hype, who we are in the marketplace, our, our, what we're good at matches our software. Literally, if we had had 2.9 in June of 2005, we would have a 50 to 70% market share worldwide right now. If we'd had the 2.9 software, now it's too late for that, right? Canvas exists. Canvas would never have existed if we'd have had 2.9 in 2005. That's okay, open source is not the speediest thing. It takes a while, this is natural. This is not unnatural for open source. But we have a wonderful product now, and it's very exciting to be part of this community. You can look at the email participation by organization as well. This is a visualization I did in a class that I teach at University of Michigan. And this is the total email traffic, and you can kind of see this dark age in the middle, and you can kind of see the optimism coming back to the developer list where we were all kind of going to sleep. We were lulling ourselves into sleep and we are like, oh, maybe this will just we'll wake up and this will all be over sometime. And so you can kind of see this uptick. That's 2012. It's not, I don't even have 2013 data on here. Um, now here's the other interesting thing. If we sort of take out that total line and we expand it a little bit, these are the organizations that contributed on the developer list. And you see at the beginning, you see places like uh, Indiana and Michigan, Berkeley, Start High, Cambridge, and what you generally see as you look at this is you see that the organizational people slowly but surely are participating less and less. It used to be the Michigan and Indiana were kind of running this whole show, right? Michigan and Indiana were almost the vendor of this product, as it were. Um, and, and then what you see is you see this increase in like the Gmail addresses, right? Cambridge kind of had an increase in the middle. But if you look now, you see Gmail addresses. And I, I actually had to take Swinsburg and make him his own company because he does so much work and talks so much on the list. So this orange, this orange, this 
little orange graph right here, this one right there, that's Steve Swinsberg by himself. <laughs> <laughs> now it's really hard to figure out where Steve Swinsberg works at any given moment, because he's kind of working for everybody all the time, and so, you know, I think we should give Steve a little, he's not here, he's still in Australia, maybe you'll see us on the YouTube, let's give Steve an applause for being able He's like the surgeon in arms of the dev list, I mean, in a good way. He makes sure that everything gets answered. But you see, you see places, the other thing you see is long, places like Longsight and Unicon uh, really carrying a lot of load. You see people like Matt and others who are the first to answer the questions. Aaron, Matt, J uh, Sam, that answer the questions that it used to be Chuck and Glenn and Lance that were answering those questions in the early days, right? And that's a different change in our community. So. Um, it's not that the voices of the Umishas and Indianas and Stanford have gone completely, but it, there's a much different balance now. That we're not looking at Michigan and Indiana as the vendors of this and somehow they're supposed to deliver for us. It's a much more diverse group of people and there's individuals that are sort of representing themselves as individuals. So that's easy. That's exciting. So Sakai 2.9, as I've mentioned before, it's really a really pretty user interface for the first time. You can put it up against the real products in the marketplace. I was talking to somebody at the cafe around, and it's like, if you put 2.8 up against virtually any other product in the marketplace, it was going to lose in a fair fight, which means the only customers we had were crazy people, right? The people weren't really rational. This was the, 2.9 was our first thing that had Lesson Builder in it. Lesson Builder was the critical thing that, in my mind, makes the difference between something that's a great book with files and a learning management system. Structured, sequence content, selective release, dynamic stuff. Chuck Hedrick over there from Rutgers. Where, where Chuck? Chuck right there, Rutgers. Uh, and uh, student Eric Jenny. Eric Jenny over the summer knocked this thing out. Why we didn't do this in 2005? Probably because our hair was on fire. We don't have as much hair as we did, but it was on fire right then. <laughs> the point was, is at the moment two nine, we are a learning management system. We can go up against anybody, and at least it's a fair fight. Right? At least you don't have to be crazy to choose Sakai at this point in time. It's a good piece of software. It's a pretty piece of software. Our standard support's good. We import, we export. It's not, it, it's not like alpha software anymore. It took us all the way, almost a decade in 2.9 to get to the point where we are a legitimate market player. It's pretty, it has features. Some of our features are market leading, lesson builder, a uh, little portal chat, some of you have portal chat turned on. Uh, those are cool things that just like, okay, that's what, we ought to be able to do that kind of stuff. And I think that what I'm really excited about now versus the six months ago is 2.9 is quickly becoming our center of gravity. I feared that we would finish 2.9 and people wouldn't install it, but places like Rutgers, Michigan, Indiana, Stanford, the sort of big three original founders plus Rutgers, that they're running 2.9, they're all running 2.9, which means the smart thing to do is to upgrade to 2.9. So we're going to become a uniform community, and we're going to be together on a product that will be able to exchange stuff and do the kind of things that we dreamed of doing 10 years ago. So we all owe those schools and everyone else like a debt of gratitude. Let's give up. take really any credit for this. It was the crazy people that at Indiana, Rutgers, Michigan, Stanford. Because the reality is that somebody has to take the first bullet on any one of these releases. And so this time it was Rutgers that took the first one, Michigan took the second, Indiana took the third, and then uh, and the Stanford sir, will be coming up in, a couple, in about a week or two, yes, the 16th of June, the, the two weeks, yeah. And, um, and so the bottom line is, is that's like a, we're never going to go back on that. It's 2.9 is here. You know 2.9 is a good product, it's running all those schools, a lot of eyeballs on it, people have been bringing all their patches back in, it's just, we're doing what we should have been doing all along, finally. Hey Chuck? Yeah? We need to give a shout out to Longsight, a lot of their clients are running 2.9, and they were definitely before IU. Yeah, oh, I agree, I agree. Longsight, Scott's probably not here. If he was, he's too sure, we can see. <laughs> no, so, let's, let's get a clap on Longsight. I just, you know, definitely been in the 2.9 camp, filled the gaps where little things were falling apart. Absolutely, I agree with you, uh, Megan, you're completely right. Now here's the interesting thing, going back to Darcy Norman's, like everything becomes Blackboard after two years. We're still not like Blackboard. We're equivalent, but we're not a clone. 
If you were to go out in the marketplace, you wake up today, and you go and you say, what LMS should you go and do? There is nothing on the planet that is better than we are at combining research and teaching. We're still the best at that. It, what we, that's why we call it a collaboration and learning environment. We didn't lose the ability to be a non-teaching collaboration system, right? Inspired by Lotus Domino, that's what we all used to say all those years ago. It has probably the most flexible role system. We don't call everyone an instructor. You know, we can call them librarians. We can call them, you know, project leaders. We can do anything we want, right? And so it, it doesn't have this kind of embedded teaching in its core. We had to add the teaching kind of forcibly later, but we started with something that wasn't just teaching, and that's something that nobody else has. And if you really look, nobody does that very well at all. It's highly customizable for local needs. A lot of people get on the dev list and say, like, we downloaded your thing and it has 1,000 options. And the answer <laughs> is, it has 1,000 options because it was built by people who can't agree. <laughs> because if you look at the Sakai at Oxford versus the Sakai at Duke versus the Sakai at Indiana versus the Sakai at Michigan, they look different for really good, or Stanford or Berkeley for that matter. There are business processes at these higher education schools that are just so different that you can't just say, oh, sorry, you can't do that. Right? Oxford, like, you don't register for a class until the class is half over. I mean, okay, what learning management system could handle that? And how many schools actually do it that way? Well, like Oxford and Cambridge. Turns out they're important, but they could just change the software, right? And so there are things that we do. There's a reason for those options, and that is to allow a crazy wide set of schools to be really happy with the product. And we're real Apache style open source. Another thing I think that is a natural thing about open source, uh, last, last Tuesday I, I interviewed uh, Katie Hafner, the New York Times writer who wrote the book Wear Wizards Stay Up Late. She was telling me about uh, John Postel, who was passed away in 1998, and one of the things he did at an internet conference, right, and there's all these important people and all these big things, and this reporter was doing this book about them, and, and he refused to talk to her until he talked to one guy way in the corner from one little tiny country that's probably this big somewhere about their domain name system, because his view was that little tiny country was the most important thing. It brings me great joy when I see somebody from Turkey or Mexico for the first time on the list, and I just watch the outpouring of love from all of us. And that's because open source is not about the money, but it is about touching more lives. And each time we touch a new country and we get a new translation, we're touching more lives in wonderful ways. And so this is kind of from a company perspective. Yeah, it's a long tail. And who cares how many schools are in Pakistan? But you know what? If those schools want this product and they want to put a translation in, they're going to do that. Now, Moodle has got more translations than we do, and that's okay. But we are the second most translated tool in uh, learn, teaching and learning software. No commercial translations come anywhere close to us, and we don't come close to Moodle. So we got still, even one school in the country to us is precious, right? Because we're not about the money. We are about the friendship. We are about the family. And when our family expands, it is a joyful thing. So this is one of my favorite uh, statistics. If you take the top 26, I sneaked in 26 because Australian National University is number 26 in their Sakai school, so it makes my numbers look better. <laughs> but if you take the top 26 schools in the world, our market share is the highest. We have more schools in the top 26 than Blackboard, more than Moodle, more than Desire to Learn, and Canvas doesn't even have a single school Right? Sky has 11, Blackboard has 9, Moodle has 3, D2L has 1, Canvas has 0. And if you look at the last three years, I believe that three of these converted from Blackboard to Sky, and one of them converted from Sakai to Blackboard. So the trend is that Sakai is still very attractive to those schools who want to maintain control of their own destiny. And I think that's important, that's an important part of the engine that drives us. Oh yeah, this is what I started out before. We're so awesome that our schools almost won the national championship in basketball. Mm -hmm. But Blackboard has this really cheating school at Louisville, and they kind of have this full court press that like hangs on you and stuff. So I think a Sakai school would have won the national championship if it wasn't for those cheating Louisville people. I hope they don't watch me on YouTube. I hope they still could win mm -hmm. Sakai so that we have a better chance mm -hmm. to win the basketball national championship. 
So I mentioned that we're, I believe we are the only real, true Apache-style open source learning management system on the planet. Martin Dugiamis is a dear friend of mine, but that's sort of control out of Perth. You can't just show up and start putting patches in. Now that's not to say that it's easy to become part of the Sakai community. We have this thing called the Technical Coordination community, Committee, and these people, most of whom have, uh, some of whom have 10 years of blood, sweat, and tears that they serve the community. A lot of people ask, well, what does it take to get in the TCC? I think probably the one thing that's common across the people that founded the TCC and are currently the TCC members is that their view of the world is that the community is their, is their family and their first priority and their institution is their second priority. These people think about the community first. They don't think necessarily about their institution first. We've seen people move from job to job to job to job in this group and yet they maintain their commitment to the community. As I mentioned, the, the leadership of this rotates to emphasize the notion that no one, no single person should ever feel that they have some control over our destiny, that this is always a collective thought. And that is not how anything else in this market space works. Rutgers University, I, I call them out in Stanford, do not have members on the TCC. But you'll notice that people from Rutgers and Stanford will have this cute little pink Sakaiger shirt because I give a Sakaiger shirt to all the people I think you know, deserve a shout out. And so I think I, I just call it the Rutgers and University in my mind have made the same kind of uh, commitments that others have made. That's like our first 10 years, or at least this time next year will be our first 10 years. So what, what might be next? And I'm not speaking for Blackboard. I'm not speaking for the Aperio Foundation. I'm not speaking for the University of Michigan. I'm not speaking for IMS Global Learning Consortium. I'm not speaking for, I don't know, the New York Times or the Supreme Court of the United States. There's a lot of people I'm not speaking for right now. Probably easier to say I'm speaking for me and only me, okay? So there's just one person. I'm not even speaking for the TCC at this point, right? Hmm. Just me. So here's the thing. We could actually relax for a while. That's never been the case for the last 10 years. We could, the TCC could take six months off and just take a nap. And we would wake up from that nap and this product would still be a fine, relevant product in the marketplace. We have never had that luxury, ever. Never. Our hair has been on fire for one reason or another for the past 10 years. It is actually difficult to go from a situation where bullets are flying over your head to when they're not. Sometimes you can win the war but not win the peace, right? We've been kind of at war with whatever it is that we've been at war for such a long time. But what I'm already seeing is a new kind of view of governance. A kinder, a gentler, we figure things out. We're not freaking out about things anymore. We've got enough stuff in this product that we don't have to freak out. You start thinking about like, whoa, what's the, what's the parts that need polishing in this product? Because before we like, what are the giant missing parts? We didn't have a great book in 2005. Yeah, you kind of miss that if you don't have a great book. <laughs> oh, we don't have a lesson builder. That, I mean, the, 2013, we didn't have a lesson builder, right? Like, that kind of gets your attention when you don't have those things and you're about to be crushed by your competition because you don't have it. But now we don't have anything that's so critically missing that we have to, like, pull the emergency cord and stop all of everything and work on it. The interesting thing is you can take more risks, but at the same time, you incur less risk in doing it. You can do bolder things, you can do more dangerous things, but if you do them gently and more thoughtfully, they're less risky overall. You can do fewer things. You don't open the whole patient up at the same time and do five surgeries on different parts of the patient's body at the same time because you're freaking out. So in some ways, we can do things that we might never have contemplated doing to this product because we were just running so fast and we had to kind of simplify and shut down and shorten and whatever just to get things done. But, but the risk can go down and the thoughtfulness can increase. So we're seeing rumblings of kind of like upside rumblings rather than anti-downside rumblings, which have been the nature of who we've been for 10 years. It's like, oh wow, if we don't do this, it's going to get a lot worse in a hurry. But now we're seeing upside rumblings. We're seeing the MOOC experiments in Amsterdam, Montreal, UPMC. They're just like, fun. They're going to change our product. That's going to be cool. But, and, and we'll say like, oh, okay, we've got to change this, we've got to change that, we're going to improve the performance here. Okay, let's kind of work on that. And when we get around, we're going to put that in the core, and it'll be fine. And we won't be freaking out, right? We're, we're doing stuff, we're enjoying ourselves. But we're not freaking out about the change in the core at a rapid pace. 
We got, we've had search has been terrible since 2.4, right? <laughs> 2.4. But now we have like two searches. Oxford's got a search that's based on solar, and our smart spring, our smart SciNet's bringing in uh, Elasticsearch. We're finally thinking about having a good search. If we sort of take a breath and, and look at that together, it's so much safer than just trying to slam it into the code base and hope it makes it through QA, which is the kind of way we've done things before. And our current search kind of reflects the nature of like, we can do this in a couple of months and hope it makes it through QA. I really think that five years later, it still hasn't made it through QA, actually. Um, but that's the kind of thing that I don't can't tell you how long it's going to take, but I can tell you it's a good idea. And it's going to be good to have really good search in like we just like I just replaced in 292 the whole Sakai web tool. Now I've been able to write that code for a long time, but the thing that got it to the point where I was willing to put it in was like Sam Sam and Matt from Longsite says I will look over every line of code for you. I will test it for you. We will test it. We will make sure it's a good idea and we'll make sure it's not broken. Because the last thing I want to do is write a bunch of code that's broken. I mean that certainly is my tradition over the past ten years is writing a bunch of code that's broken. So that's why I need someone like Matt and Sam to look over my shoulder. For me, it would have been too much of a risk to do this before I was had some backup, right? I got backup, and the reason I had backup is Sam and Matt weren't freaking out, right? They weren't freaking out on something else. They said, I'm gonna give you some time, I'm gonna look your stuff over, I'm gonna make sure it's good. And if something goes wrong, we'll run it in production and we'll test it, we'll get a patch out really fast. That kind of backup makes it so you can take more risks when you know you have backup. The dashboard tool, I think, actually might be our last moonshot. I think the thing that will, I think dashboard tool, the current home site thing, it wastes a lot of resources and it looks like crap. I think the dashboard tool is really the next most important thing, as was mentioned in the previous session. The mobile version of the dashboard tool is important as well. The notion that the one thing I think we learned from the 2.9 portal redo is that our users love it when they click fewer times. Right, and the dashboard tool is about taking four-click sequences and turning them into one-click sequences. The Neo Portal was like turning three-click sequences into two or one-click sequences because people want to get work done. This isn't Facebook, this isn't Twitter, this isn't YouTube. Hunting down for some assignment that's due right now or forgetting that you have an assignment due because you didn't dig down, that's bad. The dashboard tool can really help us do that. But then there's this other thing that happened, like kernel 1011, site caching improvements. Tell you a little story. Like in like two, four something, somebody figured they would touch site caching and they immediately broke everybody's production. Like I think Horowitz from Cape Town found the thing and we just undid the patch and vowed never to touch that code again. Right? <laughs> because it just like it seemed like a reasonable thing, but we didn't we missed something, so we just never touched it. But Michigan and Noah Bottomer just went in and took the site caching out and put new site caching in. Everybody held their breath. Everybody kind of clustered around and said, we're all going to watch together. And we actually found one bug. Found one bug in it. But instead of backing the whole thing out this time, we figured out what the bug was. We double tested. And I don't think we found another bug. And so this is the kind of thing where with people with spare time can back each other up, which means that the kind of progress that we can make on this product is really could be slow but amazing, right? Which is different than fast but loose. So we can attack larger and larger areas that need improvement, but we got to work together and back each other up, right? Both UI design, usability, we, can, we will have time now to do some of these things together rather than like, here comes some things, and it's in production, and let's do a usability analysis, <laughs> right? Because we're just sprinting so fast, right? I mean, I'm working on LTI2 with Michigan right now, and we sat down and we're starting to do a UI design before I even write any code. Like, what's crazy? Why? I don't have a ferocious deadline on this, so I can take the time to actually sit and wait. You know, we could sit and decide, you know, like let's spend two months and make sticky sessions go away. And everyone's like, oh, that's not possible. It's like, but wait a second, it's possible. We just have to think more about the problem. And we gotta get people to look in all the little nasty corners that might break, yada yada, fix all that stuff. We can fix that as a team, backing each other up. And so that you'll see this thing where We'll start seeing more and more things where we'll function as a team with backup and more involvement in each thing rather than a bunch of individual sprinty kinds of things that, that would give up quality or give up sort of uh, whatever. So what might Sakai.x be, some future version? Well, I think it's going to be big and fast and scalable, millions of users. One thing I'm learning as I'm getting closer and closer to folks like edX and Coursera is how to shard. And, um, Coursera 
has a single instance of the learning system for every class. And sometimes that instance has six CPUs just for one class. And then when the class goes away, they throw that instance on one another server that's got like 50 other like idle instances that aren't doing anything. So they scale up instances. They have a database per class. That's not a bad way to do it. I'm learning a lot from the Moodle Rooms people, my colleagues at Blackboard, about how to do multi-tenancy. And as a matter of fact, I just saw an email from Earl Neinzel. I'm like, holy crap, I didn't think this was going to happen. Let's go find Earl's mail here. Where's Earl? Earl. So this was like, this morning, this is like a critical element of multi-tenancy. Like in like Earl, it just pops up from Earl this morning. And that is moving Sakai properties from a file to a database. Our smart's been kind of pining for this idea, and you all want it too, you just don't know it yet. <laughs> this is actually a kind of a low risk thing with lots of nasty, scary detail. <laughs> right? It's not a high risk thing, but there's a million details that got to be figured out. So what we have to do is we have to line up behind Earl and say, Earl, let's put it in trunk. Let's go ahead and break a few things, and then we'll help you find it out. We're not going to yell at you, because you've done 98% of the work. The rest of us can help with the 2%. And it's a different philosophy, right? If you'd have told us two years, if you'd have told us like February of last year, when we were like in the middle of the 2.9 beta with no QA resources, that Earl would show up with this thing and say, Earl, go away. Right? But now we don't have to because we can back Earl up and we can help Earl out and then we can do multi-tenancy scalability by making it so that a single set of app servers can talk to multiple databases. You're not just saying that because Earl endorsed you on LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know what might happen to you if you endorse me on LinkedIn. <laughs> This happens to me when I'm teaching classes. It's always dangerous to like bring your email up. Yeah. Okay. Let me just go away, get rid of my email from the screen for now. Who knows? There might be some other Earl that I don't know about. They just sent me an email message. When you got 50,000 students, you never know what's going to happen next. So, multi-tenancy, right? That he just Earl woke up to this morning and decided that maybe he would send us some patches for multi-tenancy. And instead of telling him to go away, we'll probably welcome with open arms. And if he breaks something, it'll be okay because we'll fix it, right? And we won't be, Earl, why did you break us? It's like, Earl, we helped you fix it, right? So somebody from Longside will take something from our smart Asahi net, you know, spin up instances, scale this way, scale that way, scale some other way. That's the thing, another thing I learned from Corsair is you don't have to do multi-tenancy the hard way. You can do multi-tenancy the easy way by using virtualization and multiple instances, databases below it, and just shard like crazy and then just make these instances get bigger and smaller and all our performance tuning gets a lot simpler all of a sudden. Move towards easy upgrades, continuous integration, perhaps to the point where you could have like a single software as a service. Um, Moodle Rooms does a great job of this with Moodle where they just are upgrading continuously. It's really kind of neat. When will this like magic Sakai X thing happen? And I, the answer is I don't know, right? Um, I think we're going to slow to like doing a release every two years with um, uh, maintenance releases every uh, four to six months. Um, but we will tolerate in that longer time period both changes that that if we were like a week away from release, we would never tolerate, right? We'll take Earl's code. Maybe maybe we don't like Earl's code, or maybe Aaron won't like Earl's code. I don't know. But we'll we'll take Earl's code and give it, put it in and then relax enough to figure out what was wrong with it and then fix it rather than panicking and backing it back up. So we'll collectively test, there'll be some schools, you know, our smart will probably have it in production, our smart will say, our sign app will say, you know, we like it, it works, blah, 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 blah. And then Longside will put it in production and save themselves some time and energy. And Longside will say, that works for us. And then Indiana and Michigan will put it in production or whatever. So there's this collective risk sharing and validation. So that's kind of it. I'm predicting that we're going to have this sort of golden age where we're not panicking. We're going to have to learn how not to panic. We're going to have conversations that we never had time to have before. And I think it's a, a really exciting time because we're, we're sitting on a pretty good market share. The people that make up our community are some of the greatest schools in the world. And um, we shouldn't be down and out at all. We shouldn't think that somehow, you know, this is the end. I think this is the beginning, right? This is the beginning of 
what is real open source is when you have a product that's really awesome rather than a product that's kind of like crappy but beloved by crazy people, which is what we are now. And so I think it's uh, I think it's a really exciting time. Thank you for your time. Questions? Seth, I'm sure you have a question. Any questions? Oh, yeah, yeah. I think I, I will bet you, I'll bet you 100 bucks that this time next year we'll have a new hotel. And the key way that that's going to happen is there, and, and, and again, this is something that couldn't happen a year ago, but it's going to happen now. Um, what we're not going to see is like these resources magically appear and do the help. But there will be somebody or some group of people that want to make the help happen. And what they'll realize is they've got that, right? So the, so the kind of the TCC and the core resources and the long sites and the Unicons and the Michigans, somebody's going to do that. Somebody's going to, like, like Rutgers, for example, picking up lessons. Somebody's going to, like, say, drive that car forward. The difference between now and a year ago was we would have said, hang on, hang on, just wait, just wait. Don't, don't even start that, right? Because if you got it done, we wouldn't know what to do with it. But now what we'll say is, okay, we're coming. Super, super, take your risk. Fiddle with it. Fiddle with it. And if we need to work it into the rest of the product, the people who are the best at doing that will have some time. So it's not like they have time to go right to help, right? Um, but they might. It might even be those same people because they have a customer that wants it or whatever. But the key thing is not that we're going to have this panacea of resources that we can just kind of take a vote on what we want to get done. And whatever the vote, the biggest vote is, is going to get done. That's not going to change. But what is going to change is if somebody wants to do something, it'll make it quickly into the product because the people who have kind of been the keepers of the core will be able to help those people as compared to just dig us out of a, the mud puddle that we were in. And so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that help is going to be better. I mean, there are 50 ways to do it better than we did. We'll pick a couple, pick one, and the point is, is that won't be resisted the way it would have been resisted two years ago. And not, no one would agree that help, no one would disagree that help is terrible, right? Everyone would agree it's terrible, but they would say, we need lesson builder more than we need help right now. And we only have enough people to, to kind of land lesson builder in the airport, right? And so help just stay in a circle, like they would just frustrate for the help people. Like, I want to make it, but we can't land it. But now I think we'll find that the help to land stuff will be what's there. And that's where I think we'll really magnify our own resources internally, where, where we can land things and, and again, it also has to do with having two years between releases. And so you show up, your group or whatever shows up with a better help. Uh, the Florida folks are the, have some pretty awesome help. They, they land it. We're like, okay, let's work with you. Let's help it. Let's let's form it. Let's make sure that when it hits, it's not a crashing explosion sound, right? You know. And, and so the people who write the help might not know what it takes to form it in a way that's beautiful and appeals to all the like architect la di da people we have in the TCC. But the point is that the architect la di da people will help form it because we all know it's a good idea and there'll be resources. So I think that's the way to characterize it, that we can land bigger things and we can help each other because we're all not freaked out. And even things like Michigan, Stanford, and Indiana and, and um, Rutgers, they're on two nines, so they kind of might have a little spare time too all of a sudden. They might want to join your little project a little bit. And so I think there's also the schools after they get to two nine, we'll see them have some more resources. So yeah, I'll bet you a hundred bucks standing right here. We'll have help in here for now. Better help. I'll freaking write it if nobody else does. It's so bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. So do you think we're going to start seeing an increase in market share? I missed the market share section. Sorry. <laughs> well, yeah. You know, the, the problem is is that the Sakai open source community doesn't do things that have to do with increasing market share. Uh, the Sakai community does things that take care of the Sakai community, right? That's we take care of our family. And, um, the places where I think market share is going to increase are the long sites and the unicons and the Asahi nets of the world. And the extent to which they 
are more involved now as a percentage than they ever have been before um, means that, you know, I mean, it was, it was really clear when we were finishing 2.9 that this was going to make Longsight a much stronger company and much better able to penetrate sort of failing angel accounts or even pull from Moodle or whatever because 2.9 was a better product, right? And so I think the any kind of notion of increasing market share, I think we should dream of that as coming from our commercial affiliates because they're better at making those kind of things and walking in and making promises to people and then delivering on those. We open source people find promises kind of a scary thing because we don't want to lie, we don't want to say something we can't guarantee, whereas Longsight can say something and then they can like throw money at making sure that that, that, that comes to pass. Um, if I looked at the marketing goals of like the open source folks, like just kind of us open source people, I would go back to these guys. I'd be like, okay, who's the weak one of this? <laughs> <laughs> We've talked to Ed, I've been to Edinburgh, I've been to Toronto, I've been to Northwestern, John Hopkins was Sakai for a while. Cornell. Anybody have any friends at Cornell? <laughs> you got friends at Cornell? Yeah, they went to Blackboard. Well, from uh, what? From let's see Blackboard you. Classic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so they're not <laughs> very good, so let's see. Princeton. <laughs> and Penn. I, I got some friends at Penn. Chicago, <laughs> and Caltech, maybe. Eteha, maybe. Miguel, they're too close to desire to learn up in Canada. Those Canada people. Or we got some great Canada people here now. So for me, this is the kind of thing I would, like, instead of saying, what's our market share, can we get two more of these in two years? Can we get another Duke? Like, Duke has brought a lot. UNC has brought a lot. You know, these are the people that make our community stronger. And so from the community's perspective, from a marketing perspective, I would love to get two of these. They're hard. But when they come, they bring so much, too. They bring so much. So I think Longsight has the... the the market share of Longsight is going to grow. They're going to take some community colleges. They're going to take mid-tier schools. They're going to take ex-angel schools. They're going to take angry Moodle customers. You know, whatever. But I think we, the community, ought to like go get these like high, super awesome value ones that make our that make us awesomer. So we have like more higher. Like, who could run Moodle if, if you're a top 25 school? I mean, like, oh, how could you do that? <laughs> <laughs> you better have a really good skin to hide it. Yeah. MIT does. Yeah, they get an asterisk. MIT does everything. Each day it's different. Yeah. <laughs> Where is LTI figure in the next 10 years? Ooh. That's another talk I'm going to give <laughs> called Standards Future Direction. Um, this is the other talk. Oh, the future's called. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> the whole of the talk. You can defer. Uh, well, so, this is a, it's a really good talk. Uh, <laughs> Are you going to give it here? Yeah. Well, or wherever. It's later. It's two days from now. Okay. Um, I also gave it in Paris earlier, but it's going to be changed with what I gave in Paris earlier. Um, <clears throat> the answer is the future is LTI, right? In that, um, and LTI 1 that we see is just the beginning. Uh, and, and frankly, if we don't do LTI 2, it's like we just wasted our time. I mean, LTI 1 is making lots of people millions of dollars all the time. It's universal and ubiquitous. But the point is, is we can't really decompose the learning management system into component parts with what LTI 1 gives us. That's what our real goal is. A lot of people talk about LTI 1 as doing that in the kind of overhyping of standards, because the standard type has its hype cycle as well. And LTI is kind of in this point where it's doing pretty good and its, it's hype is pretty good, but it's not very good at really decom truly decomposing what a learning management system is. To truly decompose what a learning management system is, we've got to have 40 or 50 services available to every tool. We've got to have a gradebook that's accessible to every tool. Gradebook's got to be able to make 50 columns if it feels like it. We've got to be able to exchange tracking data between systems. You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all those things lead to LTI 2. But they also lead to what is the next generation learning management system and when will that happen and what will that look like? And, um, and I've told several people sort of over beers or whatever about this, and that is that um, I think that Canvas will be the last previous generation learning management system that was ever, ever built, will ever be built, right? 
So we'll go to Darcy Norman's <laughs> Law of E-Learning Tool Convergence. I believe that Canvas will be the ma last mainstream product that falls under Darcy Norman's Law of E-Learning Convergence. Okay? Meaning that their goal from the beginning of Canvas was to displace a kind of blackboard and make money in the displacement of enterprise learning for the whole campus. The moment you set yourself to that task, which we also set ourselves to, to be the enterprise learning management system for the whole campus. That's a different problem than teaching 10 classes on campus. And that's why MIT runs Moodle in the engineering school. They, each engineering professor writes their own learning management system and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but what is in Sakai, and the reason that Blackboard, Sakai, Samago have 49 drop-down buttons where maybe two would suffice is that if you have all the campus locked into one product, you've got to give them drop-downs and choices. And people are like, oh, I hate this product because it's so complex. I only want four buttons. Everyone wants the same three, but then every, everyone wants a different fourth button, and so you add those all together and you get like a hundred buttons. Right? And a crappy user interface. Right? And you can't resolve it. Because if you go to three, then everyone's unhappy. And if you go to four, then they kill each other over what the fourth button is. Right? So you just make 70 buttons and some open, closed things. Right? So what's going to happen in the future is the thing, the life form that comes next, and it's is going to be simpler, and it's going to accept the fact that it's not going to make everybody happy. And it's going to think about scaling differently. It's going to scale across campuses and take 10 to 50 classes at each campus. And there might even be five or six of these different environments, each with 10 classes. And then there'll be the enterprise learning management system. And then there'll be five or six of these things that are highly specialized, very feature poor, but highly tight in what they achieve. And you'll find situations where universities will write checks for five to $10,000 for five or 10 classes, and they will end up with eight or nine learning management systems. And the thing that will connect all those together, LTI, right? And so you'll want tracking information back, you want gradebook flow back, you'll still want to have kind of a portal or a learning management system to do all that. And so we are going to see, I think, next generation. And this is what excites me about the current direction of the OAE project, and that is, they have let go of the notion that somehow they've got to take all the features of Blackboard and put them into the OAE to be successful. And it just means that OAE is not likely to be the campus enterprise learning management system replacement thing for 22% of market share. It's just not going to be. But it could be something that every campus needs for a different, one of eight or nine new technologies that they're going to use for portfolios and other things that change, truly transform how teaching and learning work by letting go of the notion that you have to match Blackboard. And so that's, but LTI is important to that too because if those things can't talk to each other, then it's not gonna be very happy, right? So the next thing that you pop in, if you gotta do an LDAP integration for 10 classes and a this integration for 10 classes and an SSO integration, you're like, ah! So you just like make an LTI thing and you plug these things in, you host them in the cloud and write a check for $1,000 and you got 10 learning management systems on your campus and LTI is your quarterback and your Sakai is your, or even your portal is your, uh, uh, your quarterback at that point in time. And it's a, it's, I think it's a lovely future and it's a future where we're going to find things that the students, because we're going to move from sort of learning management to learning, but I think when we move from learning management to learning, we've got to, all those things are going to be high, more specialized because different situations require different things for learning and, uh, and LTI is important for that. Wednesday at 10? Wednesday at 10, but I guess don't bother coming. How much time do we got? We're done? Mm -hmm. We're out of time, right? Okay. Well, you can ask more questions on Wednesday at 10.30, right? So thank you very much for your time.